This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha, y'all. Having just spent Christmas in Texas, I had to add the y'all in there. So my name is Mitch Yu, and I'm with the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, but I'm also the host of Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is a program sponsored by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. I'm very pleased to have Lauren Reichelt. Internal combustion engines and hot cars and all that kind of stuff, and now they're being asked to you know, switch over to EVs. Is there a, a big cultural shift required for them to be accepting of that? Or is there enough business, are they getting enough business in it that you know, it's, it, it's good for them to be doing that? What's yeah. been your experience? I think, um, <laughs> I think that it depends on the person. So it definitely isn't second nature. They're, they're so used to selling a certain type of car that there's a different mentality that goes into selling mm -hmm. an electric vehicle. You have right. to think about um, especially early adopters are a different type of consumer. They come very well prepared with their own research being done. They might right. even be testing the sales associate to see how much knowledge they really have themselves. Right. Um, and and they just, you know, it, I don't even think it's a culture. I think it's just a lack of information. And okay. so we're trying to break down that barrier by being sure that they have all the tools necessary and the resources at their fingertips when they for example, don't know the answer to a question. Right. They know exactly where they can find the answer. Okay. Um, and and honestly, you know, you, you talk about like these hot cars and these these cars that they're used to selling, but EVs aren't cool. I mean, the technology is cool, and so there are a lot of, a lot of these sales guys actually um, come in and they get really excited about it, and yeah. and they appreciate the opportunity to learn about something something new and and sort of take ownership over that and. Once they sign up, they receive the curriculum online. They can study it on their own time, leading into the half-day workshop. So oh, okay. um, we do a presentation to the participants that kind of goes over the curriculum and then some additional information as well mm -hmm. um, about maybe the charging network on, on Big Island, if it's a Big Island dealership, things like that, adding in pieces that are really relevant and pertinent to them. Um, and then we do a hands-on component where they give a mock test drive to some mm -hmm fake customers that right. we bring with us and um, and then they sit down and they take the test and so in three hours everyone's finished and so far we have 41 electric vehicle experts in the state um, and they're dispersed throughout 11 dealerships on three different islands so so how receptive are the dealerships themselves to this program um, the ones that we've worked with have been pretty receptive mm -hmm. um, we don't charge anything for the program so I think that helps sure. and um, there, I mean, there are certainly going to be some that are more receptive than others, um, especially ones that have EVs um, that are a big seller right. at the moment. Some, deal some uh, manufacturers aren't sending electric vehicles to the state. And right. so there are certain dealerships that are obviously not receptive or not interested at this stage because they don't have any cars to sell. Right. Um, yeah. So what about the mechanics and the maintainers? Um, yeah, is, is there a program for them? Because you know, you come in, my, my battery's not yeah. working or whatever. Yeah, the, I mean, <clears throat> the dealerships themselves um, can handle some of those mechanics, but yeah. as far as training programs to retrain the workforce, mm -hmm. I don't know of any programs on island. Aside from um, there are, I believe, like at Hawaii Community College, for example, they have in alternative fuel vehicle course. Right. Um, so some of the community colleges are taking up that burden, I think. Um, but it, as far as people who are already gas technicians or mm -hmm. gas car technicians, they'd have to go take advantage of some opportunity to retrain themselves. Right. Yeah. Uh, so do they see this as a threat to their livelihood? Or are they, you know, what's been the reception from the mechanical and mechanic side? I wouldn't want to speak for them because okay. I haven't spoken right. to too many of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a concern whenever there's a new green right. technology coming online is, is being sure that there are green jobs and that people have opportunity to access them. Um, and so that's something that we need to figure out as a state, how we retrain our workforce right. for this, this clean energy future and clean transportation future. So what about working with uh, first responders? Because you, know, you get in an accident and your electric vehicle tips upside down and you see all these wires and batteries and all this kind of stuff, do you work? I mean, I've run training courses on hydrogen with first responders and 
hydrogen cars, essentially, an electric vehicle. And you know, part of that training for the first responders is what wires do you cut and which ones, you know, what, which ones are hot. Yeah. Is that, is that something that you would, is in place now, or is that something that you think? Not that I'm aware of. So. Um, yeah, no, I am not familiar with anything that exists, exists currently. I'm not right. sure if the city is taking that on mm -hmm. um, as far as training their own staff, especially with yeah. the city's goals for clean transportation right. um, and how they're integrating that. I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Yeah. So maybe there's an area that yeah. you guys could look at. Yeah, and I know that they're looking into, um, you know, disaster, disaster recovery and first responder um, integrating that with with alternative fuel vehicles and trying right. to figure out how that all fits together especially in the coming years and so I'm yeah. sure that'll be a piece of it when they're right. developing those plans. so do a lot of these cars have uh, power export or export power units on them I think um, not like, yet not yet eh? they are developing it um, right. but it isn't here yet it's not yet in America from what I've heard they're doing pilots though um, right. and they're starting I think they're looking at bringing them to the states so hopefully soon, and then it can be used much more effectively as battery storage and backup power and, right. um, and creating some stability for the grid. Okay. Uh, I'd like to put, before we go to break, I'd just like to put in a little plug. I just uh, brought in my first uh, hydrogen bus, and we did install a 10 kilowatt power export unit or export power unit. Gives 110, 220 volt AC for 30 hours. Wow. And then you can recharge the bus with more hydrogen in about 15 minutes. So you can start looking at your bus fleet as a mobile backup power for civil defense. Absolutely. So on that happy note, I had to get my hydrogen <laughs> plug in there, which is you know, an electric vehicle. Let's uh, mm -hmm. cut to our break, and we'll continue on after a break. So Sounds thank good. you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solutions, how to make a brighter day. What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Make it a better world. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Back from Christmas. Okay, it's Mitch Ewan here with uh, Lauren uh, Reichel from Blue Planet, and she's the transportation, sustainable transportation uh, lady. Um, and so we had an interesting conversation before the break on export, uh, um, you know, EV expert certification program. Now I want to talk about some of your other programs. Sure. So first of all, uh, one that's on my mind is uh, the Beaky, the Beaky uh, system that we have in town. It's like pretty neat. I've seen the vehicle on you know, the bikes down by where I live down in Waikiki. Um, and so do you have any comments or can you give us any insight on how that program's going? Yeah. So um, before the break, we talked a lot about electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles, and, and that's really a technology change. Right. Um, the other piece of a sustainable transportation system is the equivalent of energy efficiency um, in the electricity sector, so right. using less. So that's going to be vehicle miles traveled reduction, BMT mm -hmm. reduction. Um, and we do that through a mode shift, so changing mm -hmm. the mode under which or through which people move. So right. more biking, more walking, um, really planning our cities in a way that people can get, can get around without driving their individual cars all over the right. place, um, public transit, things like that. So. Beaky and bike share programs in general are a really um, great way for people to access that bike ability without having to own their own bicycle or test out how biking might fit into their life before they decide to purchase their own vehicle. Right. Or, I mean, their own bicycle, not a vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so bike share has been around for about a year and a half and it's doing great. Right. Um, they, last I heard, were like the seventh most utilized bike share program in the country after okay. their first year. Wow. So they've had an explosive sort of entry. Yep. Um, I know 
you know, there was the question of whether or not it would be used, how would people warm to it, and it seems to have done, to continue to do very, very well. Um, and a lot of those people are actually uh, residents as well. When you when they look at the zip codes that are being used mm. to log in, it's a lot of residents, like 60 or 70 percent residents. So what about opposition to uh, Beekey? So some of their yeah. locations. So I know I live, uh, you know, in Waikiki up at the top of Capilani Park, and I understand that the local, you know, uh, community association is against having mm -hmm. Beekeys in our neighborhood, which uh, kind of disappoints me, yeah. to be understated. <laughs> And so what's the latest on that? Are we able to get some of these bike stands you know, spread out yeah. you know, up into the so uh, Diamond Head area? They did just do an expansion mm -hmm. um, on some level. They've moved, moved into some of the neighborhoods, I believe in Makiki and, and maybe some other areas. Um, and I think that's just going to take time and conversation. You yeah. definitely don't want to impose new solutions on, on communities that don't want them there. Right. Um, but it's really about education and, and communicating why this is so important to our right. to to everyone really. I mean, in the, in the end, they benefit from it. And, and some other opposition that people will regularly throw out is, whoops, oops. Um, <laughs> is, Go ahead. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Um, is that when you put a bike share station, you block and you lose one or two parking stalls. And so that argument is made a lot where, oh, yeah. we're losing parking, parking's already so limited. But in the end, you're actually gaining parking for 12 bikes, which could move more people than two cars even. Yeah, it could be like 12 cars. You're there displacing. you go, exactly. Yeah, so, which opens up more, more yeah. parking spaces. And in the end, uh, any change like that, so these changes where, um, you're converting someone from driving their car to some other mode. It's going to be uncomfortable at first, and and it takes a behavior shift and, and a mindset change, and and those things aren't just an easy replacement. So, at least the community is engaged in it. They know it's happening, and yeah. and hopefully those conversations can get further along, and they can those issues can fall to the wayside. Yeah, I noticed they just installed a bunch up at UH, which is great. Yeah. So um, can you comment on safety? I mean, what's been the experience, uh, you know, bicycles versus cars? I mean, the car is always going to win in any, any kind of, but what's, yeah. what's been the safety record of uh, the Beaky program? Do we have any I'm sure any they do, but I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, I know that the more bike lanes we can get in, the safer people will be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important that we fund fund bike lanes at so, the city level. So how do we educate drivers, you know, about the fact, hey, look, we now have a lot of bicycles on the road. Is, is there any kind of a program there now in place? Or um, how would we do that? Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess PSA, educational campaigns, how do you reach that large of a group of people? Right. Um, ra a radio campaign would be great because everyone's right. got their radio on. But... Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's an issue. And really, I think it just takes exposure and mm -hmm. continued exposure to, to bicycles and bike lanes, keep them in the back of people's mind. And then eventually, it'll become second nature. There are a lot of cities where where drivers and bicyclists can coexist relatively safely. Yeah. Um, and so we can get there. We just, you know, it's not something that people are really used to here yet. So it's going to take some time. And we have to just be as safe as possible in the interim. Yeah, one of the things that ticks me off is uh, with bikers is the fact that they never stop for a red light or a stop sign. They just sail right on through. So they in some be. words, they should be ticketed, you know. And well, absolutely. And it's not only unsafe for them, but it's unsafe for the drivers. Yeah. It's unsafe for everyone involved. I mean, yeah. they Completely. flit right in front of you, and yep. it's like, wow. Well, and they can come pretty quick, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, up your uh, blind spot yeah. and just zoom right in front of you. That's really annoying. So. Yeah. The bike community has got to get smarter yeah. about that. And I know Beaky and Hawaii Bicycling League hold biker education courses. Yeah. So they are trying to educate the folks that are partaking in the programs right. and, and ensuring that at least those people are, are following the rules. So one of your comments before we started the show was you were looking at um, transition routes. Like you said, you're doing a map of the South Shore here on Oahu yes. of how you can join up various uh, trails as it were yeah it. so recently there um, was an op-ed written um, where a journalist tried to bike all the way from the uh, west side down to honolulu as a commute mm -hmm. and it was interesting and really relevant because we've been working with the south shore path group trying to identify how we could link up all those little chunks of bike path that exist along the south shore yeah. and make it a really bikeable 
commute path and make it a viable option for people coming from the west side where there is so much traffic coming from that direction anyways. Um, and so the challenges that exist there though are really jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So some of it is city owned land, some of it is private, privately owned land, some of it is um, you know, developers or whatever it might be. And so really trying to, it's like a puzzle piece or right. a bunch of puzzle pieces that we're trying to yeah. fit together. Um, and we've been working on that for a couple of years now and we've done some preliminary studies and, and mapped out what that might look like and um, you know, hopefully it was really great to see that op-ed and, and hopefully that'll spur some interest and so sure. we can get people talking about it and, and maybe mm -hmm. use what, what we've already done to, to create some solutions or implementation of that. So what about uh, some tax incentives for people that want to buy a, a B-Key um, uh, membership and so they can have this monthly fee because uh, uh, carpoolers and other people like that, there is a small uh, like after uh, before tax incentive that an employer can hmm. allocate to his uh, employees mm -hmm. if he wants to do that. Is that yeah? In place? I think Is that the, would a, a bike sure that rider it, qualify for that? I'm not sure if it exists right now, but it might though. Um, I know that there have been talks of, of pooling all of those things into sort of a, tr a transportation package oh, that's right. that yes. employer, employers can offer their um, employees. And right. so that would be a way to incentivize, you know, all of those folks working downtown to not drive to work. Okay. Um, so looking at what that package might look like, like, oh, you can either drive your car to work or we'll give you you know, this many lift credits and, and a pass for Beaky and a bus pass and you can do that instead. Um, so yeah, I mean, all any incentives I think, especially as these um, alternatives are growing in popularity, okay. I think is really important to spur interest in, in the early stages. Can you uh, care to comment on energy efficiency? So, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, as I said before, I think energy efficiency, transportation sector energy efficiency is is essentially using less. So. Mm -hmm. Um, all of these are, are really great options for, for saving energy, basically, in the transportation sector. And also saving money. They're, all these alternatives tend to be cheaper um, in the long run than, than driving your car. Cars are really expensive. Yeah, they are. Uh, <laughs> they're not cheap, and I think a lot of the costs are, are hard to see. Yeah. Um, all of the oil changes and insurance. the maintenance costs and the insurance Going. and... Um, parking, oh my goodness, parking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the same way that energy efficiency can save households money and save them energy, transportation efficiency, essentially right. driving less can do the same for households. Right. Okay. Yeah. So have I missed anything that you would like to talk about? No, I think we covered it. You did? Yeah, <laughs> wow. just all of it, right? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing the uh, the Blue Planet report card on transportation because we always get like a D minus <laughs> on transportation. Transportation's been a tricky one uh, the past few yeah. years, and so there's a lot of people working on the transportation front, but yeah. when electricity is um, primarily managed by the PUC and our mm -hmm. utility, transportation is dispersed and it's hard because there's no central entity to change. You have to change yeah. the minds and the decisions of a whole group of people. And so, um, Thousands you know, of people have to make yeah, the decision. They yeah, they have to make the active choice to do something right. different. So it's a slower process. Um, behavior changes take longer and, and hopefully over the next year we'll make some more progress and keep chipping away at it. Well, come back and tell us about it. So, <laughs> I will. Lauren, thank you very much. Thank it you. It was great having you yeah, here. Thank you. Well done. Great project. Thanks.